bear with me for a second. I just had it open a moment ago, but I'm going to go to my clinical photography presentation, which I typically give. And I'm going to start with this slide here. And remember, I have probably about 40 different presentations I do. So I'm just going to start here with you all. Can you see that okay? Yes. And everybody here is unmuted. So uh, if you feel like you're muted, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself if you have a question. But this is being recorded. So uh, if, you, if anybody has any questions, please ask. But somebody has music on in the background. So if you don't mind muting yourself, um, I appreciate it. Uh, so this is the original image from 1899 from Dr. Angle, who's probably one of the fathers of modern orthodontics. And in either case, he, he shows a certain relationship here of how the teeth should be hitting to call it a class one. You might be wondering why I'm sort of talking about this, but when you, when you look at a, when you look at a, um, sorry, I don't know why it's going back. There we go. This is what every lateral arch shot should look like. Okay. If your images don't look like this, this is what you're supposed to be shooting for. So I want you to take a look and see, I've drawn a little marker onto the molars and onto the cuspids. And what I'm showing here, or what I'm trying to show to everybody, is this is what a class one, or, or this is what we should be looking at to be able to diagnose if it's a class one or not. So if you take a look at this picture, you can see where the lines are drawn down the middle of my cuspids and where the mesial buccal cusp and the molar is. But this is what I'm seeing a lot from a lot of offices. And suddenly it looks like a class one. And to be honest, if this is what you're showing your patients, if this is what you're showing your general dentist that you work with, if this is what you're showing the parents, then you're lying to them, okay? You're giving an untruth. And if this is what your doctors are seeing for the ladies from Dr. Finelli's office, uh, again, this is not truthful. So again, looking at the difference, when you look at this versus this, this is what the occlusion really looks like. And if I show you this, I'm showing you something that's not true. So the first thing we have to talk about here, or what we are talking about, is really intellectual honesty and discussing the concept of what are our images really need to look like. So when we talk about the lateral arch shot that, that Heather was talking about, this is what it needs to look like every time. So I don't care if you cut off your second molar by accident and you just show me this, this is what's going to tell me whether or not my treatment outcome and my treatment effect were reasonable. This is what's going to show me my post-operative result and my pre-operative diagnosis. So just keep that in mind as we move through things. So again, when you wanna diagnose or you wanna look and see if your picture is good, look at the section of the picture that's 90 degrees to you, right? So this part is what we're staring at straight on. This is sort of tailing away from us a little bit. So again, when you have a good lateral arch shot, and Heather, this goes to your question of a good lateral arch shot, this is what you're looking for, is you wanna look straight on at the first molar and the bicuspids. Does that make sense to everybody? You okay with that? Okay, so I haven't gotten to how you get there. We'll talk about that. But again, there's an example of a really good picture on the top left. Can you see my arrow, by the way? Okay. Um, this is a picture of what's more commonly seen, which is, you know, this is what's 90 degrees to you, not this. This is tailing away and this is tailing away. Can we all see that? So this is what I see a lot of, and this is what I'd like to see more of, because this is a fair representation of our clinical images. Are there any questions on that before I move on to the next part? Please feel free to speak up if you do, because I can hear all of you. Okay, so if your images look like the latter picture, don't, don't fret. This was from a journal um, from the AJODO. Uh, Vince Kokich had asked me to review a book on clinical photography a few years ago, which I did. And if you look at it, you'll notice that, you know, what's 90 degrees to the picture here? Right, this, and, and that's, this is a book on clinical photography in an orthodontic journal. So if your images aren't looking perfect, don't feel bad. Now here's something else published in the AJO Dio. What's looking at your 90 degrees? This is, not this. So just be fair with yourself when you sort of look and see what are you looking at? What are you staring at? Um, and really try to be self-observant in terms of what you're doing. So now all of a sudden we've got this picture from the front. <laughs> And when we look, what was that? I don't, I don't wanna know what's going on out there. Um, but when you look at this picture, right? This guy, is there a dog attacking somebody's microphone? 
Um, I thought my headphones were on. Um, we might want to mute you. Sorry, you've been muted. Circle gets a square. Um, so if you take a look at the anterior portion here and you see that this bite is open a little bit, you know, what about when I do this? I could lie to my patients and say, here's how the case started and here's how the case finished, right? But it's just bad camera angle. And there was a, a presenter on the circuit years ago who got thrown off for doing that. Or I could show that. So when you ask yourself the question, which one of these three is correct, how do you figure it out? So you have to look at your lateral arch shot to get a really good idea of, of realistically, what am I looking at? Where, you know, when I look at the front open bite, which one of these three does it really look like? And obviously the answer is this one. So you have to have a good lateral arch shot to be able to tell some time with the anteriors, you know, what you've really got and what's going on. Everybody okay with me here? Okay, now I'm gonna close out of this for just a second. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna come over to this slide right over here and say that, you know, there's two types of cameras and nowadays there's really three, but one of them falls into the category of, of point and shoot, right? Here's your point and shoot. It's less intimidating, it's lighter, it's smaller, uh, it's less expensive. And then you've got your SLR on this side, which really just offers more control. And I would say, and I would say our camera phone, uh, our phone camera falls onto this category, not this category, right? And as you see, there, there's a whole lot of stuff that we can talk about. Now, this is a lateral arch shot. Are, are you guys seeing, um, I'm just trying to play with something. So if you, can you all see all this? And I took you off my screen so I can see it. So I just need like somebody to give me a verbal yes that you can see this. Yes, we see the shot. Awesome, thanks. So you can see a couple of things about it, right? Um, this was the first patient I ever shot images on with the um, camera, with the Galaxy S6 that I purchased for $200, uh, 240. Uh, you can see that the resolution wasn't the greatest. It's a little tiny speck blurry, but I think we would all argue that this is way more than good enough for our clinical needs, that unless you're lecturing on the big stage, unless you're really, unless you're me, who's the guy standing in front of the room presenting pictures as his thing, nobody's going to ever pick you apart for a picture that looks like this. And certainly it's more than good enough to show to your patients for case presentation. So let's dissect it a little bit. The occlusal plane is centered right down the middle of the screen, right? If this is the bottom and this is the top, the occlusal plane is right down the middle. The first molar and bicuspids are really 90 degrees to us. It demonstrates pretty good dryness. I captured most of my second molar over here. Um, and I can see the contralateral central incisor. Seeing the contralateral central is really the key to knowing if you've got a good lateral arch shot. If you can see the lateral or the cuspid on this side, you came too much from the front. So are there any questions that anybody has for me about this particular image uh, in terms of what we're looking for? I'll take that as a no. So let's look at our occlusal shot. Again, first occlusal shot I ever took using the camera phone. And we've since gotten better uh, working with uh, resolution, definition, flash, the whole nine yards. But I, I would grade myself um, probably a B minus on this shot. Uh, I got things out of the way pretty good, but um, you can tell that this is higher than this. So I wasn't looking straight down on the, on the picture. Uh, it's pretty clean. Lips are out of the way pretty well. I have a little bit of lip covering this tooth. Um, Cheeks are out of the way pretty well, and that's a function of my mirrors and my retractor. Uh, I'm gonna take a second and pause and tell you guys to consider going to my blog. Um, it's dentalphotography.blogspot.com. And if you go there, um, you'll notice that there's a post that I did about a year and a half or two years ago on how to grade your images. So you can just go to the search bar and type in grade or something along those lines and it'll show you how to grade your images okay so again i give myself like a b minus on this picture here any questions on the enclosable shot at all okay brandon did you have a question no okay 
No, I just, I heard you. So I thought it said you were talking. I didn't know if you needed anything. It doesn't bother me at all. So my point is, I don't care if you use a camera phone uh, or phone camera. I don't care if you use an SLR. I don't care if you use a point and shoot. Just know how to use your setup. Uh, learn how to use it properly. Don't be afraid of the SLR. It will give you better pictures. Uh, the, yeah, they're bigger. Yeah, they cost more. Yeah, they can be intimidating. But if you learn how to set them up, um, you'll do really well with them. And, and I just want to show you there is some, I'm not going to get into a huge amount of stuff here because I don't want to overwhelm you, but here's a great website called snapsort.com. Uh, you definitely should consider going there. It's a great place to go to for a uh, comparison of cameras. So for instance, you can type in any two cameras and it'll tell you which is better. It'll give you a place where you can go check them out uh, and how much you can buy for them and they're trusted sellers. And on the bottom, it'll tell you why you should buy one camera or the other. Uh, and you can compare any two cameras. It's kind of cool. Uh, and if you want to see more about a particular camera, you can just go there and punch in a particular camera and it'll explain it to you and talk about it and do all those sorts of things. So I just want you to keep in mind a few things. Bells and whistles don't matter. Uh, get a camera that makes sense for you. Don't dream of uses that'll never be used. Uh, get the features you really need. And I would strongly suggest that right now, if you're getting into this stuff, get the least amount of camera you need because you can always buy a better camera if you're doing a good job. Don't mix and match, buy everything from the same manufacturer. If you're buying a point and shoot, this is irrelevant. Uh, but if you're buying a Canon, buy everything Canon. Don't buy a Nikon lens. Don't buy, you know, a Nikkor. A, um, if you have a Canon, uh, don't buy a um, Sigma flash and a, uh, you know, there's a whole variety of different lenses and stuff you can buy. Just buy everything from one company. Uh, and for instance, like Nikkor or Nikon is the only company that lets you buy a wireless up close flash. Well, that's good enough for me to buy everything from Nikon. So whenever I kind of laugh and chuckle in all these big groups when people say, oh, are you a Nikon guy or a Canon guy? Uh, very few people actually understand why they should be or shouldn't be. So again, think through the whole camera system. For me, a wireless flash was a huge deal and Nikon is the only one who makes it. So I'm going with Nikon. It's that simple. If Canon made a wireless flash, I consider Canon. Though for dentistry, Canon isn't as easy to use as Nikon for most things. Uh, always buy from an authorized dealer, super important. Um, authorized dealers mean that you're not getting uh, gray market or black market goods. Sorry, just getting a drink. A lot in a month. Um, bear with me for just one second. Sorry, I'm just... Bear with me, I'm just looking for something. And I'm just, I'm trying to do something that it's not letting me do. I just, there's a lot of noise coming from somebody and I don't know who, so I'm gonna ask everybody, if you can just mute yourselves for just a second, I greatly appreciate it. Um, I just can't, it's hard to hear because I'm hearing a lot of background noise because uh, I've got an ear set. So if you're not muted, please mute yourselves. Somebody's getting a weather check, something about their car, which is a 2008. So if that's coming from your house, if you can mute yourself, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so anyway, Canon and Nikon. Like I said, if you buy a Nikon um, from a non-Nikon authorized USA salesperson, you've immediately bought gray market goods, which means that you, Nikon USA warranty is void immediately. Um, most people don't know that. So again, Buy a Nikon from an authorized dealer. And all you have to do is ask them, are you authorized? Uh, hopefully they won't lie to you, but it, you got to check up on the credentials. Are you buying gray market goods? Learn the details of the warranty because a lot of times they're going to say to you, oh, don't worry, we've got a warranty, but it's really Joe in the back of the room who's going to fix it for you. Do they have a loaner program? You can go to a couple of companies that are out there, dental companies, uh, like Dine is one of them. Um, uh, I'm drawing a blank right now, but you know who I'm talking about. They all have loaners. Uh, and if you want to get a loaner, you can, but you, you are going to pay considerably more for your cameras uh, through these companies. So just keep in mind on eBay and online, if a camera is $1,000 and you can buy it for $800 or $400, there's a problem. It doesn't make sense. Uh, it's probably too good to be true. So just keep that in mind. Uh, here's just a quick little, I'm going to close out of this particular page just for a second. And I'm going to skip the whole TTL versus aperture section because I think it's too much uh, for, for us to cover right now. But there is a point that is worth talking about. And if you all can see this, I just want to show you that, you know, some cameras that have come out in the last five years, 
Uh, you can see 15 megapixels, 19 megapixels, 16, 13. Megapixels don't really make a difference. Um, and the reason I say that uh, mostly is because if you take a look at this picture of this flower and I zoom in on it, you'll notice how the flower is becoming very pixelized, these little building blocks that make up the image. And, you know, if you look at the greatest, one of the average good screens you're going to buy today for your, for your computer, it's going to be about 1900 pixels wide by about 1200 pixels high. So, I mean, that's a decent monitor to have in your office. It's not an Apple retina display, but it certainly is good. If you do the math, it's 2.28 million pixels. It doesn't matter if you've got a 25 megapixel camera or a nine megapixel camera, unless you're really zooming in on an image. And if you're taking good images, you shouldn't have to. So don't be fooled into believing that megapixels make all the difference. Though um, in, cam in phone cameras, the resolution has certainly gotten much better. Uh, what I do want to show you a little bit is the reason why I really like point and shoots less than I do SLRs is because of depth of field. And when we look at depth of field uh, and you look at, oops, sorry. Come on. You know, if you look over here, you'll notice that, you know, this on the left has very poor depth of field. Only this is in focus and the back is not. This one has great depth of field. And it's very hard to get good depth of field with a point and shoot or with a phone camera simply because of the fact that you can't control f-stops. And I'm not going to get into the whole histogram, f-stops, aperture priority discussion today. Because if I do that, that's going to take me 45 minutes in and of itself. But just understand that um, the settings that we can get to in most, and I say most, point and shoots don't allow us to vary the depth of field. Uh, and here's just a good example of depth of field. You know, this is poor depth of field. This is great depth of field, both taken with the same camera, but I was able to vary the settings to allow us to do that. So you wonder what's the clinical representation of this? Well, if you take a peek at this picture that was taken with a, a relatively lower f-stop, you know, look at the bicuspid area. You know, it's completely out of focus, but if you take a look at this, every, with a more modern camera with a higher f-stop and a higher flash, you can see much, much prettier, much nicer, much more in view. So. Uh, if you're going to shoot point and shoot, no problem. Just recognize there are certain control aspects you're going to give up. So I'm going to try to get out of this section because I don't want to bore you with it. But are there any questions so far? Any, you can unmute yourself if you have a question. Uh, <coughs> just going to take some water. No questions so far? Nothing? Okay, I'll just keep going. I want to show you a couple of things here related to lighting. Uh, the color of the walls that you use is huge, as well as the texture. Uh, same wall, same patient, same camera. A uh, little different lighting setup, but for the most part, this is my onboard camera flash. Um, you'll notice that uh, things that are semi-gloss or even have any hint of gloss are going to show off the wall much more so than something that might be a little darker or perhaps has less sheen to it. Uh, I absolutely love this color. I am a big opponent, that's with an O, not a P, an opponent of the LED lighting behind people that's white. If that's your thing, go for it. Um, it was originally invented because dentists did not get rid of um, shadows, which is the easiest thing to get rid of uh, by just rotating your flash one way or another. But again, you can't do that with a point and shoot. And you'll notice there's no shadow around this woman up here. So I don't need an LED panel to give me uh, a nice picture and I'd rather have colored and beautiful pictures that don't look quite so clinical when I show them to patients. So again, um, you know, this is my buddy Kevin who's also part of this group. Uh, Kev, if you're here, you look great, buddy. But I, when we take our final photos of our patients, would you rather have a picture that looks like this or would you rather have a picture that looks like this? And you know, you can always tell my friends on Facebook because they have this picture with the flash setup that I used when I was in ortho residency and Kevin was a co-resident of mine. So again, if it's going to come down to, I'm going to show you how to do that in just a little bit, but I want to show you depth of field. Again, this is a low f-stop, a high f-stop. On a low f-stop, things are out of focus in the background. On a high f-stop, same picture, same place, same everything. But this light over here is really this over here. Um, and so I'd like to have a low f-stop when I shoot this picture, but a point and shoot won't allow me to do that. So again, you just have to sort of keep that in mind when you do that. Now that lighting I showed you before for that, that, picture of Kevin where it looks really nice. Uh, it's called the Stellar Lighting Systems 18 inch ring light, but I would just go on eBay or Amazon and look for an 18 inch ring light. And all it is is just a round fluorescent light. That's it with a little holder. The whole thing weighs about one pound. Really easy to use. Um, 
not difficult in any way to use this thing. Uh, and all it does is it just, there's no flash on your camera. All the light is supplied by this and the patient stands holding the light uh, and it shines on their face and just gives an absolutely beautiful lighting. And that's what I use for all my post-ops. And people comment to me all the time how much they love it. The mothers love it. This was my daughter when she was about 12 years old. Um, I gotten it that day and I said, hey, I'm gonna shoot a picture of you and I did. You know, I worked in an office when I was in ortho residency uh, doing all of their social media stuff. And so, um, you know, these were his pictures in his office. And you'll notice regardless of what color background you have and no matter what color your eye or hair color is, you know, people just turn out really nice with this lighting. And it was nice because it created a sort of effect that was his practice. So when people saw his pictures, uh, they loved it. And if you go to my Instagram or if you go to my Facebook uh, for my practice, you'll see a lot of these. And the mothers love them. Uh, there's a program I'm going to talk about in a little bit that'll show you how to post-process these in about 10 seconds, and you can delegate that. Uh, and before patients leave the office, I've already had my office already email them the picture of their child. Uh, and I'll just digress for a second and tell you that when you do that at a D-bond, give them a testimonial form um, that asks them to give you a testimonial from mom or from the patient talking about why your office was so great, because they love you at that point. They think you're great. And you can use this picture uh, with actual patient of Dr. Finelli or do actual patient of Dr. Krieger um, with their testimonial across the top or across the bottom. Uh, and you, you're not going to have a better marketing thing for Facebook or Instagram. So for sure, uh, that little ring light has changed the way I, my practice works. And I mean, you can see it. Yeah, some people hate the lighting in the eyes, but I tell them to get over it uh, because this is cheap. You can buy this light for less than 100 bucks now in some places. It's easy to use, it's instant, um, it, it checks all the boxes. And again, you look at my buddies on, on Facebook, they all use the picture that I shot of them. It's just the way it is. So um, it works great for little artistic shots. If you have a beautiful smile when you're finished, this was just something I picked up and took to a general dentist's office the day I got it and started shooting pictures. But imagine if these teeth were beautifully straight. Imagine what a gorgeous picture this is, right? Shooting at a low F stop again, so I can have everything out of focus except what I'm shooting. And I, I mean, this is the kind of artwork you'd put on your wall. So any questions about this light or anything related to it that I can talk to you guys about? You're a quiet bunch. Okay, I'm assuming that nobody needs more time to unmute. So let's go to backgrounds because everybody loves black backgrounds. It's more of a big deal in dental, in um, restorative dentistry, but you know, you have two ways you can do it. You can either go buy one or just take one out of your three ring binder, cut it into the shape of a tongue and just put it behind people's teeth and cold sterile it. Uh, it works really, really well, uh, works beautifully. Uh, and you know, for the cost of a three ring binder, you can have two of these custom made to whatever shape you want. Works really, really nicely. Um, this is really a, a really nice feature called the Digital Lighthouse. And again, you can go on eBay and you can buy these from China for like $10 I bought one for $19 or $29, including the two lamps, the pop-up box, and four different color felts that go in there. And so these were originally invented for eBay auctions so that somebody could take a picture of something and show it online and it looks really beautiful. Uh, but I've adapted it for lab work, for dentistry. So my cast, when I was a restorative dentist, yes, there was a time I used to do lots of wax ups. Um, when I would do this stuff and I bring it to a meeting or I'd be lecturing somewhere, I wanted my images to be the best in the room. So isn't this a whole lot nicer than taking a picture of lab work sitting on a bench or on a bib or something like that? Like this is the kind of stuff that I would take pictures of. And I will tell you that I've morphed in a blue background just because I thought it was fun to do and looks good. But it's super important that when people do that, they tell you. Um, you can change anything you want in a picture. Uh, you can make it sharper, you can make it duller, you can make it lighter or darker. But if you're gonna do anything, and those are called global edits. If you're gonna do anything called a local edit, meaning you're gonna clean off some dust over here, um, dust people will let you get away with. Uh, if you're gonna change the color, if you're gonna sharpen this, if you're gonna add something, you've gotta disclose it. Those are called local edits. And if you do that without disclosing it, it's a big no-no in the world of, uh, of online and uh, in-person lecturing. So here's a picture of a, a hybrid I used to, you know, one of the cases I did back in the day when I was having fun. Uh, with restorative work. Um, and I wanted to show the underside as well as the, the visual side of it. And so I put this on a mirror and I tell everybody, you should do this with your own lab work. If you ever wanna show what a Herbst is, if you wanna show what an expander is, 
um, just put it on a mirror. Uh, but you should have a good mirror handy. I would not use these kinds of mirrors. Um, no matter how good they are, they're rear surface coating, which means you could scratch this all you want. The coating is underneath. So you get kind of a double image. Um, if you use a, a really well done um, rhodium coated mirror, uh, which is what I use for everything, they scratch easier. But if you keep one reserve just for lab work, uh, get a big one, uh, the biggest you can get, you can shoot all your images like I did on this. So any questions about mirrors? Okay, so I'm just gonna show you, I, I like to problem solve. So I shot it six different ways. I, I was in school at the time and I found this weird diastema creating appliance to open up space, um, which was for whatever unknown reason never used. Uh, though it is kind of a cool device, but you can see the different ways to shoot it. I shot it on a dental bib, which is what a lot of people are doing. Um, I shot on some black felt. I shot it on a mirror. Uh, I shot it in that light box on the white cloth, but you can see some shadows. I didn't like that. I shot it on the black felt in the light box, but again, didn't like that. And then I shot it on a mirror, uh, which with the white background of everything showing, and I thought that was sort of the nicest. So again, um, I would be comfortable appliance notwithstanding, uh, showing this image at any dental meeting anywhere in the world and feeling that people would look at it and go, you know, this guy really cares. Uh, so again, uh, it's important to recognize that when you show your images to other dentists, you're gonna get judged, both in a good and a bad way. And it's fair and it's unfair. Um, I've shown my work uh, images like this around the world and people just naturally assume that I must be some amazing dentist, but I don't necessarily think that's true on any level. But you know, people can only judge what they see and what they can see are great images. And the natural uh, extrapolation is that, hey, if, if this guy does great images and cares about that, then he's gonna care about the other stuff. And I think your patients may not know the difference, but you certainly will. So um, I'm gonna skip this section on setting up the camera because I really wanna get to uh, the mirrors. So these are the mirrors that I created. Um, you may see them now that Mary reached out to me on Mary's list and so now, you can get them on Mary's list with a little bit of a discount. I really don't make a whole lot of money on them, uh, but you know, again, I like to fix things. As you probably have guessed, I can't leave things alone. Uh, and so I really had a problem with these old mirrors. I felt like this end is way too bulky. Um, this concavity was a little bit too big. The mirrors were a little bit too short. Um, I will tell everybody here, if you're using stainless steel mirrors, then we won't even have a discussion because the reflectivity is horrible. The scratches are terrible. It's just not the kind of mirror that would match the kind of orthodontics I'm trying to provide. Um, and I tend to be a little categorical with certain statements and I try to step back and backpedal sometimes, but that's a statement I'll never take back. There is not one, and I can say this categorically, and maybe you're the first, but I've never met one high quality dentist that I, that's a mentor of mine who, whose work I try to emulate who uses stainless steel mirrors. I've just never seen it. And if you're the first, good for you. Um, uh, keep it going. If it's working for you and your images look amazing, go with them. But every dentist I know who's exceptional uh, uses rhodium coated mirrors. And that's why they've been around 50 years. Uh, they are the most expensive on the market. There's chromium, which is a poor man's mirror. Uh, it doesn't have very good reflectivity. Uh, there's titanium, but it can only be single surfaced usually. So you're not getting a lot for your buck and it really doesn't have great reflectivity. So again, my point in all of this is do what's been around for 50 years. Don't try to save money and be a little bit cheaper. Uh, go with rhodium and you'll never be unhappy with it. And just don't put it in an ultrasonic and don't let it touch metal. Uh, I keep mine five years and they work great. So I was unhappy with that shape um, and I went to, oops, sorry here. I went to these kinds of mirrors. Now these are stretched out. These are not quite as long and thin as they look. Uh, they look a little bit unreasonable here. But notice that the end is more tapered and the middle is wider. So um, they come in three sizes, uh, small, medium, and large. I use medium and large on almost everybody. Uh, I use small rarely on little kids, but for the most part, small and uh, medium and large work great. Occlusals are the same thing. I've got large, medium, and small. Uh, I use large and medium on almost everybody. I use small on really, really small kids, like five, six-year-olds. Uh, otherwise, everybody else, that's what keeps the cheek out of the way, is this hump right here right back here. That's what keeps the cheek out of the way. If you use too small of a mirror, the cheek collapses over the occlusal surface and you just don't get anything really good out of it. So um, again, just giving you a heads up. 
I'm not trying to sell you all my mirrors. I really, at the end of the day, don't care if you buy them or not. But unfortunately, they're the only place in the world you can get them because nobody's willing to carry them. So just giving you a heads up on that. So again, um, I'm going to cover some more stuff in just a second. But this is my email if you need me. Uh, this is my website of my office if you want to ever go check out anything. And here's my own personal cell number uh, if you ever want to get a hold of me. Um, I'm going to stop sharing for a second here. And I'm going to go look at the chat because I was unable to see it while I was sharing the screen. Um, so I'm going to look at a couple of questions we got. Uh, I'm going to start at the top, if you don't mind. Um, from Mark, would like to know whether def defining using custom white balance is important. Um, so that's a great question, Mark. Are you sure you're not a prosthodontist? Uh, because that's the question I get from every prosthodontist. Uh, I would tell you, don't worry about white balance for what we do. We don't need color accuracy. We need color consistency. So we don't need white balance uh, because we're not trying to share with a laboratory for porcelain. Um, we're not trying to get on the cover of, the cover of Quintessence's magazine on ceramics. Um, focus on, on mirror retractor use and you'll have 99% of what you need to do. So um, does that answer your question okay? You're right there, Mark? I'm assuming that's a yes. Um, I'm just looking at the next question. Um, my biggest concern from Darren is developing earn, uh, learning a tech, easy technique than the SLR ring flash, traditional technique, orthodontics learning residency. So I can teach that to you um, as Dr. Shaw can attest how to, how to use an SLR like piece of cake. Um, but there's a reason I need a full morning to do that with dentists. Uh, maybe at the annual meeting, that's something I could do with everybody. Uh, it's just really, really hard because uh, I need to teach you about f-stop. I need to teach you about histograms. I need to teach you how to get flash settings. But once you learn that, it's really, really easy. Uh, let me just see real quickly. Um, if I take you, if I take you over here, I'm gonna give me just a second. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen with you one more time, and I'm gonna see if I can get you into here. Can you all see that? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, the easiest way, Darren. Are you with me there, Darren? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. So, do you know about f-stops and flash settings and stuff like that? Yeah, I've, I've actually set a lot of the custom settings on mine. Um, I found what worked well when I was in residency and kind of stuck with most of those same settings. It's more teaching my staff how to duplicate my results. And I had got some that are great and some that just seem to have a lot of trouble picking it up. And we've got our settings set in the camera and we've got them written down on the wall to double check them at, at least weekly to make sure someone's not hitting something. Well, if, if they're not... You know, if, if you're looking at, so I'll just tell you what, I can only tell you what I've talked with offices about for about 15 or 18 years. Yeah. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to get into absolutes and tell you that my way is the only way, but I will tell you that I always ask people to follow up with me. I follow up with them. And in 20 or so years of doing this, my technique seems to be pretty easy and straightforward and straight line. So my, my point here is, um, this is the sheet I give everybody as a starting point. Um, I tell them to dial it in using their f-stop or flash settings to get where they need to get, and that takes time to teach. Mm -hmm. How, however, um, your ISO setting should be at 200. Um, don't play around with fancy ISO settings. Go 200. Your camera shutter speed should be at 1 125th, and you should be shooting JPEG large. Uh, do automatic white balance and shoot um, the biggest file you can shoot, the largest file setting it lets you. If you do that, you should have only about two settings you ever have to mess around with on your camera. One is gonna be a full flash setting um, that you're gonna use for your extra orals with an f-stop somewhere around 13. And the other is going to be uh, about a quarter flash in most cameras uh, at about an f-stop of about 29. That's all your assistants need to know. If they're not getting good pictures, then it's mirrors and retractors, because if you don't get the lips out of the way, then you're gonna end up having problems with the flash being able to light what you want it to light and you'll never get what you want. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't mean to make it sound simple, but it really is simple. If you have no, a cheat that's, that's, I agree with you. Okay, cool. Anybody have any questions related to that at all? Okay, and Darren, you can always reach out to me if you ever have questions. Um, I mean, that's, that's what the group is all about, right? Um, 
And I can always do a web conference down the road at another time on just histograms, f-stops. It'll be really exciting for you and me, Darren, and everybody else will be fast asleep. Yeah, um, in, in 2004, when I bought my first SLR, I uh, went through the manual. It actually taught you a lot. So, yeah. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you guys. So the question from Jerry, sorry, I'm eating and thought I'd spare you all. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jerry. Uh, he wants to know, how do we get better buckle shots um, and a grading system? So real quickly, um, and I am going to finish this on the hour, just out of respect for all of you. Uh, but I'm going to take you, um, I'm going to share a screen and I'm going to try to get into my, the problem with sharing a screen, oh, there we go. I'm going to take you to dentalphotography.blogspot.com. And again, if someone could just let me know that you're seeing this okay. We see it. Okay. So you'll notice it's been around a while. We got about 310,000 hits on this. Um, there's the 18 inch ring light that I talked about, right? With my daughter, everything I just showed you. I, I, I do everything I can on here to, to cover topics that are germane to clinical photography because I have so much free time on my hands. I always want to find something else to do. Um, but again, let's go up here uh, to the search bar and let's just do grade and see what comes up. And yeah, I want to send that. How are you evaluating your photography? And you'll notice that I talk just a little bit about how I'm grading my images. Um, I give everything, and this is how I do it with my team. I'll take a look at this picture and I'll come up with five or six categories. Like, is the arch centered? Can I see the entire arch? Um, am I looking straight down on it? Is the tongue not covering the occlusal surface? Is it dry? Is the lower lip out of the way? Is only the mirror image visible? And I'll give each one a, a weight of one to 10 and I'll grade them. And you know, I'll let them grade themselves first using these criteria and I make sure they read this first. Um, and then I'll see their grade and I'll see my grade. And I like to sort of figure out and make sure, are they seeing things the way we're seeing? So again, um, I don't remember what I gave this and I haven't looked, but I would grade, um, I would grade this as probably a pretty good, I, I mean, I'd give this a solid A minus uh, in terms of a grade. And so I gave myself a B plus here, right? So at least I'm consistent without actually running down it. But you'll notice the arch was centered. I don't think I could have done better. Uh, the entire arch is visible. I'd like to see the retromolar pads a little bit better. Uh, am I looking straight down? It's just slightly tilted backwards. Uh, is the tongue covering? No, not even close. Uh, is it dry? Pretty dry. Is the lower lip out of the way? Mm, I didn't do a very good job with that one. The lip is covering part of the teeth. Uh, and is only the mirror image visible? Yes, I don't see anything else other than that. So again, that's a 61 out of 70, which gives me 87%, which is a B plus. So hopefully, does that answer your question about how we, uh, how we should be grading ourselves? Jerry, was that okay for you? I'll take that as a yes. Um, Heather, you asked about the website where you can buy things. Um, again, you can go to my website, uh, dental photog sorry, kriegercontinuum.com. Uh, it's just my name with continuum, which has two U's, kriegercontinuum.com. If you have any questions, you can always message me, but I don't want to make tonight about selling my mirrors. Um, I'm just looking here. You're welcome, Heather. Uh, Jerry, glad you love it. Um, Glenn from Mark, um, what lens gives you an f-stop of 45 exclamation point? So here's a little fun fact that you may not know, and, and I don't want to go off on this for too long because it'll bore the heck out of everybody who already looks really excited. Um, I don't even want to wake Leon up. Um, but my, my point is, if you buy a Canon, I'm sorry, a Nikon with a Nikon lens, it will give you a 45. It will allow you 45. But the, there's an ongoing debate as to whether or not if this is zero and this is 32, is it just making the numbers between zero and 32, stretching it into smaller increments and making it a 45? Or if this is 32, is it really giving us to here? And there's debate about that. There are people who say it certainly does give us to 45. Others say it's just a virtual 45. Uh, but if you use a Nikon lens with a Nikon a camera, it will know it and give you a 45. If you use a Sig Sigma or a Tamron, it won't know. You'll only go to 32, uh, but it becomes somewhat academic. So um, you said the use a Canon, so 45 is foreign to you. Uh, but I don't know if you use a Canon with a Canon lens, you might be able to get that. So uh, I think I hit most of the questions that you've got. I want to go back now 
And I want to see if I can get us to, I'm gonna share my screen with you in just a second, sorry. And just bear with me. I wanna to go to uh, our Facebook and I wanna see, I, I have, I think if I'm not mistaken, let's see if this shows us the video. I saved it before and we'll see if it takes us there. Can you all see this all right? Thanks, Gordon. All right, so I don't think you can hear me, right? So <clears throat> I'm gonna turn off the volume on this. This was the video I shot. <coughs> Sorry, I just need some water. This was the um, video I shot when I ordered a, uh, it, it just, again, I love to tinker and the idea of, there was a big discussion on one of the websites about ca phone cameras. And I said, you know, most of them are not that great. And if you're gonna drop $300 on something, why don't you just consider getting a phone camera? And um, what's worth noting is that I bought this Galaxy S6, which is arguably one of the top two or three ever best phones on a camera. It's 16 uh, megapixels, which is pretty big. It gives you a ton of variety of, of, of uh, professional settings if you want them, like ISO, uh, f-stop, things like that. But I shot it completely automatic. And what I was trying to show here in this picture is that, um, let me see if I can fast forward a little bit. I went out and I bought two things. I bought a, a custom camera case that I had made at mycustomcamera.com. I, uh, I think, I'll look it up when we're done. But you'll notice that the back of it has my logo on it. Because someone had, someone had made a point in one of the groups that, oh, it's going to look so cheap and chintzy and nobody's ever going to want you to, to shoot with that. It's going to look cheap. I disagree. I put a custom case on it and I put a Wii remote. I drilled two holes and that's what I was trying to show you before. Um, I drilled two holes and I put a Wii remote onto it. So you can see that right there. And now my assistants um, have a camera that they can shoot. And best of all, because it's not, uh, it's an unlocked phone, it's on Wi-Fi. Uh, if a patient's done with treatment, they can shoot a picture and put it on a Facebook page immediately. Um, and I found a really cool transfer app. Uh, it's called Photo Transfer at the App Store, where from right where we are, we just click a button and they all go right over on, onto my server. Uh, it's really cool. It never leaves our Wi-Fi network, so nobody could ever argue that it's not HIPAA secure because it never goes through the internet. I mean, it does technically, I guess, but it never leaves our our um, our IP. So. Here I am shooting uh, a picture on one of my assistants. She was really nice to just step in and be an assistant on a day we weren't supposed to shoot. Uh, and I'll show you the pictures in just a minute. But, but here we are. And you can see I just, nothing, it's just simple. I just have her smile, I shoot, and I'm gonna move. I'll, I'll let you guys see this real quickly because I want you to, you're seeing the camera and you're seeing her, so you're getting a really good view of what it is I do and how I do it. Uh, nothing up my sleeves, uh, you know, no, hitting camera tricks, no pun intended. And I, I want you to notice real quickly uh, as I'm over narrating, I don't use a heating pad. There are proponents of a heating pad to warm your mirrors to keep them from fogging. I cannot stand it. Um, I first saw it about 20 years ago, a friend of mine in Arizona. And, you know, they've been known to burn down offices uh, if left on. Uh, they can create all sorts of problems. Um, they're just, they're, if you have a dirty mirror, what are you going to do? Put it back in and get it reheated? Uh, there's so many flaws with it and reasons why they take up a lot of space on the counter. So again, if I'm going to shoot anything uh, that's in a mirror, I'm going to heat under warm water for 10 seconds. And that's what I was turning on was the water. So here you'll see, I've never used this camera before. I decided to zoom in a little bit to shoot the pictures because it made it a little bit easier. But I learned afterwards that if I zoom in, the resolution isn't quite so good, which is what you saw when I showed you that picture with a little bit of blurriness. So just follow what I'm doing with most of my um, photo. The, I, I have a repose picture where I just have her say the woman's name, Emma. It puts you in perfect repose every time. So you can really see where the incised ledge is at rest, which again, harkens back to my days as a restorative dentist. But uh, it's a lot of what Vince Kokich talked about with his restorative diagnosis. Now, this is really important. Um, and I, I, I'm gonna show you a couple of things in just a moment, but I just turned off the water is what you saw me go do. And this is all happening in real time. So notice when she's retracted, she's retracted out and forward. 
right? She's not pulling them back. If you pull them back, the lip tends to drape over and cover the teeth. So always pull them out and forward, the retractors. Everybody okay with me? Anybody got a yes? Anyone? Got it. Okay, cool. So there's the picture. Hopefully this video is helping you because you can see it in real time. But I, I started using a flash intra orally. Notice extra orally, I didn't. I like to take this picture with them slightly open because it shows incisal edge wear. Because if I have to intrude lower anterior teeth, I want them to see how short they are and I want them to see the wear. So I love taking that picture as well. It's not a picture that you typically learn in ortho residency, but it is a picture that every restorative dentist in a pros residency is gonna learn. So again, I just run, I like to run a little soap over my mirrors for a second just to get off water spots, run it under some warm water for no more than about five seconds. You can use paper towels on rhodium coated mirrors. Uh, they put micro scratches, but they don't play any role in what we're doing. So again, you can do that. Now this is important and I'm gonna try to pause this. Okay, this retractor here is a normal plastic lateral retraction mirror. Uh, uh, a lateral retractor, it's normal. This retractor, which is hard to see, is the same retractor with the end cut down a little bit. And when we're all done, I'll take you to my website and show you. It's hard for you to visualize here, but on the contralateral side, there's always a cut down lateral mirror. You'll understand why in a minute. So what I do is I place it in, I place my mirror, and then I remove my retractor. So right now, I have a mirror and a retractor on the contralateral side. Now this is the point where a lot of people get screwed up. They typically at this point will suddenly go and grab the camera. And that's a mistake because we still need to set the shot up. So now I'm gonna have her grab it. And right now she's in complete control of everything. And this is what I do on every patient. And I've never shot a set of images on her. So I don't want you to think this is atypical. This is very, very normal. So at this point, you could take 30 seconds if you wanted to, she's totally comfortable. But what I'm gonna do is put my retractor down and I'm gonna take control of both the mirror and the retractor. Now, the harder I pull this retractor, the more I'm pulling that mirror in, the harder it is for me to retract it and get things out of the way. So what I'm gonna tell you to do is to move that retractor over to the midline so that I can pull this out more. But if I move it to the midline and it's a regular retractor, it's gonna fall out, out of the mouth because it's too big. So watch, I have both, I move it to the midline, and I have her hold it there and I tell her to push it against the teeth. I then let her hold the mirror for a second as I get my camera set up. And remember, this is the first time I'm ever using this camera. So then I grab the mirror and I'm, and I'm pulling things out of the way. Now, what I want you to notice here is this retractor is at her midline. It's not being pulled. Just by doing that, you'll change your pictures instantly. So stop pulling on this so that you can retract this. Okay, got that guys? So, you can see the picture I've got here by doing this. It makes all the difference, this is very typical. So I already got my left lateral shot and that's what it looks like. Everybody okay with that? Everybody all right with that picture? I'll take that yep. as a yes, thank you. Usually I'm used to standing on a stage when I present. You have no idea how difficult it is when you're talking and you can't see anybody. So now on the other side, we're doing the same thing. I have a small cut down retractor on this side and I've got the mirror on the other side. But this, this side is easier, why? Because I can hold the camera in my right hand and I can hold the mirror in my left. On the other side, I have to go cross-handed because I can't hold the camera in my left hand. I guess you could nowadays with a phone camera because it's not a righty or a lefty. But if you think about the old school cameras an SLR, there's only, a, um, there's only a button on the right side. So you always have to hold it in your right hand. So I center that in the middle. She holds it for a second. I tell her to make sure that this is pushing against her teeth. I don't want her pulling it at all. I grab the camera and then I grab the mirror. And here I go, I'm pulling everything out of the way. And you can see where I am right there. It's, you know, people always ask me, what kind of mirrors, what kind of uh, mirrors do I use? What kind of retractors do I use? Those I think do make a difference, but they say, am I a Canon or a Nikon guy or a point and shoot or an SLR? And I say, I could care less. It's all about mirrors and retractors. 
If people spent one tenth of the time working on mirrors and retractor usage as they do on their cameras, their pictures would look amazing. And that's how quickly I get a lateral shot. Heather, can you hear me? Was that okay for you? I'm assuming the answer is yes. And then the occlusals, I do something a little bit different. I lay people back flat as a pancake and you don't need to watch the whole thing. But this is how I shoot. That's, how, that's the position of my patient for an occlusal. Every patient I shoot, this is how they look. Flat as a pancake with special retractors that are cut in half. And again, this video is on our orthopreneurs website, uh, Facebook group. You can go back and look at this anytime you want. From beginning to end, it's all narrated by me. And again, I'm over her from behind and you'll never miss an occlusal ever again. It's the easiest shot on earth to get. You'll see, I'm just holding things out of the way. I have her open real big and shoot the picture. Boom, piece of cake. That's what we get. It's really easy. If you, you just have to put yourself in a position to succeed. If you're sitting them in the wrong position, if you're using the wrong mirrors and retractors, if you don't know how to use them, you'll never succeed. So at the end of the day, um, that old Henry Ford saying, you know, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're usually right. If you're sitting there right now saying, my patients will never do this, my patients will never let me, this will hurt, yeah, it will. But if you take my word on this from somebody who's, who's presented this technique to probably, I don't know, 20,000 doctors in the last 20 years, and nobody's ever complained about it, it works. Look at the occlusal shot I just got in about five seconds, and this is routine. Um, you'll understand that, you know, this is, this is what we get. This is what we do every time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a second. Um, and actually, you know what? I don't know why I did that. I'm gonna share you guys again. And I think where I wanna go is over here. So these are the actual pictures I took on her that day. So this is the facial picture that we took. I'm, I'm remoting into my office right now. And again, I think all of these are more than acceptable. Right, notice I don't need an LED board. I'm not using a flash, it's just ambient light. Remember, I, this is a screenshot. Um, the way things are brought in, there is a little bit of resolution issue because I zoomed in on her. Remember I talked about that. But I think that these are more than adequate for showing. I don't like this because it is a little out of focus and that's why I stopped zooming in. Right? It's not that it's out of focus, but we don't have enough resolution. It's, it's fuzzy for that reason because we zoomed in and then had to zoom in again. So again, um, I, I, I personally, uh, I like this shot that works for me just fine. I like this shot. It's a little bit fuzzy again. So we stop zooming in and we just do it in dolphin. There's my occlusal upper. There's my occlusal lower. But again, I think most people would be very happy with this. They would take this and say, Hey, um, you know, I'd run with this shot and use it without a problem. I want to real quickly show you one last thing and I'm going to go to my website. So this, somebody was asking where you get this stuff. Um, the creakercontinuum.com is my website. And again, I'm not here to sell you mirrors and retractors, but I'm sorry with all the, the um, bandwidth I'm using for our um, conference, it's hard to get to see things. But again, this is what they should look like every time. This is what we do. So if you go to mirrors, I wanna to go to the retractors so you can see them. And it's not easy to see on the website, but let's see if it comes up. So if I zoom in a little bit, you can see that this is your normal retractor right there. This is your normal retractor with the end cut off. And this is the occlusals. They're like a normal retractor with one side cut off. Can everybody see that okay? Is that all right for you? So again, um, you should never uh, sterilize these plastic retractors, no matter who makes them. Plastic is not meant to go in a sterilizer long-term. You will cloud them, they will crack, and eventually they will break and you'll have to get another set. Um, but again, um, they work really well for me. I enjoy them. Uh, and that's how, I get, that's how I get the shots that I'm you know, looking for. So what questions can I answer for you all? It's about nine o'clock. I know I've thrown a lot of information at you, but hopefully, Heather, um, that helped you out. Um, does the camera flash, I see here from Alex, does the LED camera flash cast unwanted shadows onto the tooth surface? It's hard to see the picture from the S6. Oh, no, I don't see a problem with it. The problem you're gonna face is because your flash is right next to your lens, 
you're not going to see um, a lot of surface texture. But as a non prosthodontist, who cares about that? So, uh, uh, and someone wrote to me, I have two Canons and just bought three Galaxies. Want to take photos with the Galaxy, want to take with the Canon. That's up to you. Um, you know, right now I'm having my assistant shoot with the Samsung just because it's lighter on their hands and easier to use. But remember, you know, I've given up my lecture career for right now, but I'm not saying that I'm not going to eventually do it down the road. So if I'm on stage and showing picture shot with a Samsung, you know, I'm going to look like the idiot in the room. So I can shoot just as easily with both cameras and I prefer using a, an SLR and I'm going to let my team shoot with this for a while. But you know, if, if I, it, I think it's really good as a training camera for sure so that your team can learn how to master mirrors and retractors before they start worrying about whether or not they're gonna use an SLR. And then once they have mirror and retractor use down, then transfer them over to it. If you're just taking progress shots that are never gonna be shown to anybody else, use your Samsung or whatever you wanna use. Because remember, giving an assistant a camera for $200 at each station with your name on it, now opens up the possibility for them shooting funny selfies, um, training videos, a whole series of things. So um, a camera is just a camera. A phone with Wi-Fi opens up the, the experience to a lot more. But any other questions I can answer for you guys? So before you all leave, I just wanted to throw out one more thing for you. Um, everything we do is being recorded in, for every web conference we do. And of course, I open this one up to team members, uh, but typically they're closed just to doctors, but team members can watch them later on. I've had a problem, and I'm just trying to explain to you why you're not seeing them yet posted anywhere. On Vimeo, which I thought was the answer, it's really hard to create a channel that nobody else can see. On YouTube, I can create a closed channel, but only up to 50 people, um, which makes it troubling. I can make them private, but you'll never be able to find them. So the issue we're gonna have is we're probably gonna just have a private YouTube account that if somebody were to stumble up upon our web conferences, so be it. Um, I don't really care so much about that, but I do respect the privacy for every one of you uh, a ton. And I, I think being part of this group is important that we know we've got privacy, but I fought this now for six weeks and I have no answer. And I've spoken to everybody I can, and I, I, we're more than likely going to have a private un, or, or unlisted um, YouTube channel. And I'm just gonna dump everything in there. And if somebody comes along it somehow and finds it, well, so be it, I, I just don't care. Uh, so anybody have any questions, input, anything y'all wanna know? Um, yeah, Glenn. Yeah, who is that, Jeff? Yeah, how hey, you Jeff. doing? Good. How are you? Uh, we'll talk you're later. You're, you're smiling. Well, we'll see. <laughs> um, so I have a I have a Canon DSLR with a ring flash and everything like that, and sometimes it can't lock onto the actual image. Like I, I press like numerous times and it just won't lock. Yeah. So I'm a little. I get a little frustrated. I don't know why my DSLR camera does that. It just hiccups like here and there. And I, I don't know why. Uh, maybe you can provide some insight on why that might happen. So um, what's happening is your camera is shooting what we call TTL through the lens. You don't have a, believe it or not, you don't have a ring flash. Is it a Canon flash? It's a MR... MR14. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, it's, yeah. I swear I do this. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It's, yeah. it's the MR14EX which is, it's actually a dual point flash that looks like a ring. It has two yeah. flashes that look like this. But yeah, that white outer layer. Yeah. Yep. But there's a flash here and a flash here, and that's actually two separate flashes that you can control. Um, but your camera is shooting through TPL, through the lens. So what it's basically saying is, I'm gonna do all the metering, I'm gonna do all the focusing, um, and I'm gonna put this whole thing together and, and make a picture out of it. And the problem is, um, shooting these pictures up close is really hard and the camera has no idea what to do with its metering system. So you need to shoot on aperture priority um, and it takes more time than anybody here wants to sit and listen to. But, okay. but um, you know what I'll do for everybody here just as a courtesy. Um, if you email me at glenn at orthopreneursrd.com, I showed it at the beginning, Glenn with two N's at orthopreneursrd.com. Um, if you email me uh, at that address uh, with your full name of your practice and your address, I will mail to you um, 
my DVD that I created on choosing a camera, how to set it up, uh, and um, how to understand lighting. So you'll have an easier time with that. Is that cool, Jeff? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. It's only about $945. Uh, so you can, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, just as a courtesy to my fellow RD members, it, you know, it's something that people have bought around the world, but I would never charge you guys for that. Mirrors and retractors, I don't have much choice because I really don't make a penny on it. Um, but the DVD, whether I give you one or not, does, it doesn't have any more cost because I've made a thousand of them. And if I give you two, it doesn't matter. So um, yeah, just uh, let me know your address and I'll make sure one gets out to you in the next week or two if that's okay. Okay, yeah, thanks Glenn. My pleasure. Um, any other questions that I can answer for you all? So I'm, I'm going to tell my, my father in Florida, who happens to be my shipping manager um, for everything I do with my continuum, um, that I'm going to send you the other DVD as well to all of you who send me this email. Um, and that'll be kind of like your reward for showing up to this meeting tonight and sitting through this for an hour. Yeah. And anybody who actually watches the DVD will actually see this and know they can get it. Uh, I'm a firm believer that people who go out of their way deserve something more. It's not to say that people who are, weren't here tonight don't deserve it. But it, if they weren't here, hopefully they'll watch the video. And if they get to this point, they'll know what to do. So um, what I was going to say is I have a second DVD, which is kind of like what you saw me do with Keeley, but it's actually with an SLR and they followed me around clinic doing what I did just before, but professionally, and it's my other DVD. So I'll make sure you get both of those. And again, if you weren't part of RD, it would cost you about $350 to get them, but I love giving back and I'm happy to give them to y'all. So please email me with your address and I'll send it to my dad and make sure that they go out and it'll keep them out of my mother's hair. So you've done my family a favor. Um, anything else or 909, are we done? So I'm going to, technically you all get CE for just watching, but I've got to test you. So give me 24 to 48 hours to create the uh, test that I usually do on class marker that you've all filled out in the past. And when you fill it out, it'll print out a certificate for you and you will have gotten one hour of uh, AGD sponsored CE. So um, thank you all for coming. I'm always here for you if you ever need anything. Uh, my phone number was on, on here before. So if you ever need to reach me, please feel free um, and just have a great evening and we'll chat soon. Thanks, Glenn. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Glenn.